they are shopping for food together. Each person is going to have a different demand curve for the food. We're going to say, this is back to so public versus private goods. So we're going to say the food that they consume can only be consumed by them. Remember last time we talked about the private goods, it's rivalrous and excludable. So we're going to have separate parts in our refrigerator. I can only eat the food that I bought. So in a private good, we need to add up our quantity demanded for each price. My example here is frozen pizzas. It's kind of sad, but maybe. Uh, so at a high price, so there's, uh, so there's three roommates. One has a higher demand. He's, he's going to go for like the nicer pizzas. The medium demand roommate is in the middle, and the lower demand roommate. Uh, the high demand roommate will get, would, would buy some of the higher priced pizzas. The lower demand roommate is only going to go for the lower priced pizzas. So we'll have three different demand curves for frozen pizza that we'll need to add up to figure out how much pizza to buy. These are just some sample numbers, but we need to go shopping. And when we're going to go shopping, uh, so we have three different demand curves. Okay. So uh, this is the, we just have the, you know, the, the points to plot um, from the different roommates. Uh, $4, this person would buy three pizzas. $2, this person would buy, I don't know where it is, four pizzas. Anyways, you can see I'm just taking my sample numbers, drawing a line through them, color coding them. This tablet is not working for me. Right, so we have a demand curve here for the high demand roommate. We have a demand curve here with these four dots for the medium roommate. And we have a demand curve here for the low demand roommate. I'll take those away so you can see the colors. We need to sum those up. They're private goods. We need to sum them up. So this is like thinking about the shopping list. At each price point, we have how many would be, would buy, we would buy across the, roommate, across the different roommates. At the lowest price point, we would sum it, and we would be getting 16 pizzas at Costco. So here, like, we could say, this is Costco. This is Whole Foods up here. <laughs> or just different brands or something. Um, so the question is, across the three roommates for a private good, uh, we'll take this last column here, and we'll want to graph that of how many to buy. If it was down at, here's our price, if we're down at $2, we would be buying 16 pizzas across the three roommates. At $4, we would uh, be buying nine pizzas. So we're summing here. Um, the demand from each roommate. These three points are summing up to give us this point. Wait, sorry, I'm this This point, this point, and this point are summing up to give us this point. One roommate wants two, one roommate wants three, one roommate wants four. Together, that's nine pizzas. So we're summing horizontally. Let's do the other thing. The roommates are going to shop for something that they're going to share. It's non-rival and non-exclusive. If you remember the categories from last time, we're talking about public goods. My use doesn't decrease your use. It's non-rival, non-exclusive. I can't stop you from using it. So this is just an example. Now we're going to sum vertically. And so in my roommate apartment example, we're going to buy a lamp for the living room or chairs for the table or something. Some sort of furniture that we can all use, we can all share, we can all um, use together. So uh, this type of spreadsheet that we started with isn't going to work. We need to change it so that we would have prices paid for each quantity. This schedule that I started with was how many would we buy for each price. Um, so we need to look at the willingness to pay for each quantity. So here I've switched it. So this is quantity and how much the person would pay. So this is the number of lamps. Now we can think about this. Uh, this person is willing to pay a bunch of money for a less number of lamps. This person would pay less money for the first few lamps, but would pay, still pay money for uh, a greater number of lamps. This is like, let's buy Christmas lights and put them all over the place. Anyways, just as a sample, we're going to have, again, these three different demand curves, just saying different roommates have different preferences. We need to add them up. At this point, we need to add them vertically. So for the first two lamps that we're going to buy, we know that the first roommate would chip in six bucks towards buying the two lamps. The second roommate is also chipping in six bucks towards the two lamps. The third roommate here for the first two lamps is only pitching in four bucks. But collectively, they're putting money into a pot to go to the store. Here, maybe this store we could be like, this is Crate and Barrel. And this is Ikea. I don't know. I'm just making that up. But uh, you know, people would have different preferences. So if we go to Crate and Barrel, we could put together $16 to get the first two lamps. So here's our adding up. So people, uh, so for two, we had six plus six plus four. We would have $16. to pool up to buy the lamps. For four lamps, uh, we would have less willingness to pay, because the first high demand person is willing to chip in less to get out to this larger number of lamps. They're sharing it, uh, so they don't need to have so many of them. This one roommate who wants to put Christmas lights all over the place, he's out here by himself. If he wants to buy those Christmas lights, they better be cheap, because he's the only one paying for them. The first roommate who uh, they, can, they can agree they can get together for the, just the first couple lamps. So we just can compare these, intuitively thinking about it, this an aggregate demand curve looks really different between a public good and a market good aggregating across the three roommates. So this one, there's going to get some high values for low numbers here. It's going, to go, it's going to go up pretty high. So we only need a few that people can chip into. What's important with roommates is to make sure like, everybody's contributing and doing their fair share. Like, how, how, a lot of times public goods don't work because people don't have a way. The other example here that's tough with roommates, right? these two roommates paid six bucks for the first two lamps, and this guy only paid four bucks. And usually with roommates, it's really hard to do a deal like that. Right? You all have to pay the same amount. And so a lot of times, this sort of deal breaks down between roommates, where each person pays what they're willing to pay. Usually, by fairness, you want people to pay the same amount. If we have this uh, rival and exclusive good, it's easier if we can say, keep out of my part of the refrigerator and don't eat my pizza, so then we can fairly go to the store and buy things together. Uh, so we're going to compare the consumer surplus that we're going to get. right? And importantly about consumer surplus, we're going to think about each additional unit that we're providing. How much is consumer surplus going to go up with each adi additional unit? And so for public goods that are shared, it's going to look really different, the consumer surplus, the welfare benefits. For private goods with like a different elasticity, a different slope here, each additional, additional unit is going to have a lot smaller value for the market good that's shared. Um, so this is really important because what we're doing a lot of times in environmental economics and definitely in the next couple of class is looking at people's willingness to pay. We're trying to estimate people's willingness to pay. We're asking people questions about their willingness to pay. We're looking at people's behaviors and trying to back out from them what their willingness to pay was. We're looking at different ways to calculate willingness to pay out of either surveys or revealed behavior. So, and then we can do it for individuals, and then we'll multiply that out times the number of people that are using that resource. We'll do a small subsample to get a demand curve and multiply that by the number of people affected by a resource. 
Uh, and that can be a really important question. How to do that multiply? What's the basis that we're doing things on? We have an environmental good or some environmental cleanup. How many people are going to be affected by that? Everyone in the Bay Area, only the people who go bird watching, so we have different subdomains to do it on. Um, we talk about it in electricity. In the textbook, as I said again, is going through the example about electricity. In the electricity case, we know that almost everyone uses electricity. And we're changing the demand curve on electricity. Uh, we're changing the price of electricity, asking people to conserve. Another, you know, to bring it back to the, the issue of today, the water, the drought, everyone uses water. Should we be pricing it differently? So one issue here in electricity and water, it treats individuals with the same weight. But some people have much higher incomes than other people. So the amount of money that a wealthy household spends on electricity is a tiny fraction of their cost. Poor household, it's a monthly bill. Those monthly bills add up. And then we have, as consumers, urban versus rural. So we have people consuming electricity in cities where it's dense. There's a lot of light there, but people are, are sharing resources in the city. Rural, there's people way out there using more resources just for themselves. Uh, so this brings us to the question of elasticity. I'm not going to work through this too much. I, hopefully, you're going to do it in section. Uh, but definitely, there's uh, a tutorial that I put on the web page on elasticity, where you can sort of go through the web page and plug in some numbers and see how elasticity changes. You can look at the Khan Academy. He does a really nice walkthrough of elasticity. But the basic one that we're thinking about here in our demand curves is the price elasticity of demand. The price elasticity of demand is the amount that quantity, the percent that quantity changes with the percent change in price. So mathematically, and you can walk through this in section, or uh, it's the change in quantity divided by the quantity where we are, wh where we are, which point that we're on, and divided by the change in price over price. So if we have a change here, we would have a change in price over a price point. We would have a change in quantity over a quantity point, and we could put those into percentages. What's important about elasticity is there's no units on it. Any way that I draw a graph, there's going to be units on it. There's going to be a way that I've scaled it. But elasticity doesn't have a scale. It's a percent divided by a percent. Uh, so price elasticity of demand is always negative. One uh, thing we can think about uh, is between 0 and, one, 0 and negative 1, or if it equals negative 1, or if it's less than negative 1. If it's between 0 and negative 1, we say that it's inelastic not very responsive to price. If it's exactly negative 1, then 1% 1 change in price leads to 1% change in quantity. It's exactly minus 1. If it's elastic, if you have a big change in price, if it's greater than minus 1, then a 1% change in price will lead to more than a 1% change in quantity. So just remember, it's not equal to the slope. It's, it matters where you are on a slope, because it's normalized by these quantities. The first term of this is the slope. The second term is normalizing it by where you are on the slope. So you can't just think about whether it's steep, the steepness of the curve or not. So as we go from left to right along the curve, the, the elasticity formula is going to change because these ratios are going to change. It's a combination of the slope and where we are along the curve. Um, so this is going back to a, a short review of um, equivalent variation and compensating variation that I talked about last time. It's a little bit confusing. I'm going to drag you through it again. Uh, as, and, uh, but the way that I want to do it to motivate it is where we're moving next is into surveys. And it's related to how we ask surveys. So uh, equivalent variation, which I'll walk through a little bit, uh, would be the money that a consumer would be willing to pay instead of an increased price or a decreased quantity. And uh, compensating variation is the least money that a consumer would accept in order to allow a change in price or quantity. Um, equivalent variation, just these are the basic elements that we need to think about. The EV, you end up at a lower utility curve. If prices stay the same and the income was taken away from the consumer, how much money would you take away to get that consumer to the, a lower utility curve, and that same utility curve that they would get to with a change price? Just, I'm not going to go too much through this. This is the same graph from last lecture. But you start at point A, prices change, and you go to point B. And then point C is with the same price ratio as in point A, but at a lower income level. And one thing to look for in the book when they explain this is that instead of quantity 1, quantity 2, here they can put the environmental good on this axis. And here they can put all other goods on this axis. So this will be you know, a proxy for everything else that you're consuming. Um, I don't want to get too bogged down in that. Uh, there's more interesting things to talk about. Compensating variation, just again, this is how much you would have to pay to get back to the indifference curve you were on. You start at point A, price changes, you go down to point B. What's the compensation to your income that would get you back up to the utility curve, the indifference curve that you started at? And I want you to keep these in mind without, thinking, uh, without getting too bogged down in the math so that we can think about how questions are asked. So in compensating variation, the price went up. We went to a lower indifference curve. We want to find a budget constraint with a new price ratio, but a higher income that gets us to the old indifference curve. How much do you need to compensate to the consumer for a change in price? So in bullets, this is, could be your willingness to pay to get an increase in the public good, and the EV would, could be willingness to pay to avoid a decrease in the public good. And this is, gets us back to the property rights question when we're talking about environmental. Who has the right to the environmental benefit? Who has the property rights? So just in an example from the textbook where we're talking through wolves in Yellowstone. If the environmentalists start out with the right for the wolves in Yellowstone, the equivalent variation question is how much uh, would the environmentalists be willing to accept to give up the right to have more wolves? If the ranchers have the right, and this is the way the program's actually working, how much would the environmentalists have to pay to get more wolves? So this is to accept less wolves, and this is to get more wolves. They're going to converge on the same number, but there are different ways to think about things. So here's uh, you know, some starting at the, at the questions that we're going to ask. So compensating variation question, what's the most money you would be willing to pay to have more wolves in Yellowstone? The equivalent variation question is, what's the money you'd be willing to pay to keep wolves from getting killed by ranchers? So they're getting at the same thing, but we have different ways that, they're at, that they have accuracy in terms of economic measurement. Uh, so equivalent, just another way to ask the same question, equivalent variation, what's the least money you'd be willing to accept instead of having an increase in wolves? Like, wolves are going to be capped. What money would you be willing to accept to stop it at that cap? Um, and what's the least amount of money you'd be willing to accept to allow ranchers to keep killing wolves, re related to how the questions are? 
Another example from the book is about Endangered Species Act and spotted owls and loggers in the Northwest. So the spotted owl was an endangered species uh, that lived only in old growth forest. And it created a whole huge thing between the federal government, who owns a lot of the lands in the Northwest that are being logged, and how their relationship was going to be to the communities that depended on logging these national forests for their jobs. So if you protect the owl, you have less jobs for local people in the Western United States, or you know, Western Northern California, Oregon, Washington. So if uh, the environmentalists are entitled to the land, but not necessarily the land as pristine forests, they'll pay up to their equivalent variation for some old, to leave some old growth. So this is a question of the government owns the land. The environmentalists have the right to petition and ask the government for protection of some of the land. Uh, but what's the, what's the value that we're going to say on keeping some old growth? Uh, there's an interesting one in the textbook. This is a whole other area, experimental economics. So giving a whole bunch of students in a lab and asking them. So in this experiment, they had people taste a super bitter liquid. They gave them like a little cup of a super bitter liquid. It was like not, not bad for you, but it tasted super bitter. So these were uh, ways that they sort of looked at the difference between compensating variation and equivalent variation. So one is, I'll pay you if you try it. You don't have to try the super bitter liquid. They, they let people try it. They let people repeat the game, as they do in experimental economics. If you repeat the game a few times, people learn the rules. How much could I pay you to take another sip of that? And in another version of the game, they, for equivalent variation, they uh, made people drink it and could pay to not drink it. Right? So these are getting at the same thing of making prices and bidding. I mean, in this case, they probably gave people an endowment of money. So uh, it's not actually trying to um, make them pay to not do something they don't want to do. Yeah? Yep, but it sort of depends on who's got the rights to the, to the change, how you phrase it. Yep. In the book, what they talk about is these numbers converge. You get let people play the game enough times, and the values actually converge. Um, another thing that's interesting in the book is talking about what the price for elect electricity is. Um, the willingness to pay for, electri electricity, for electri electricity. So we talked about last time there's a demand curve for electri electricity in the book. And uh, we talked about trying to get the, the, you know, these measures of the consumer surplus under, well, they're, they're actually like this, under this demand curve. Um, it would be efficient to charge one price for electricity. And you would have households that want a lot of electricity buying more electricity and households that want lower, uh, you know, households could sell their excess electricity. What actually happens is that we say people, some people get a baseline of a cheaper price. We, want, we do this for water and electricity. We're setting prices where you can use the first chunk at a lower price. Then the next chunk, can you see this graph on the bottom? So there's different tiers here. It's 13 cents per kilowatt hour for your first chunk that your household is allotted. Then 15 cents, then 31 cents, then the big use households are 35 cents per kilowatt hour. So this is how we do it where um, we're, we're actually, fill, the, the price of electricity is filling in this demand curve here. We're saying this, you know, there will be a low price for the first big chunk. Everybody gets some first chunk for a low price. Now, let's say, you know, this is like simple apartment. It's efficient. You can live under this baseline. Some way to think about this is a swimming pool, a hot tub. You know, what are things that consume a ton of electricity? So for the people that want to have a swimming pool or a hot tub, they're going to be up here paying a bigger chunk of their demand curve. Different prices for different people. Uh, the interesting, this is going into the electricity. So the price of electricity is determined by the government, by a board that oversees our regulated monopoly. We've decided it's more efficient to have one person provide electricity to everyone in the region. This is PG&E. So we're in here, and this is like the catchment area of PG&E. There's a citizens sort of experts board, the Public Utilities Commission that's elected, and they set the price of electricity for the state. Uh, what's interesting is the baseline quantity that you get for cheap is different depending on where you are in California. So there's the coastal people here. There's the city's letters, Q, X, T, R, S. So where you are, what zone you are, means what, how big your chunk of your first cheap electricity is. And so here's our zones. So let's remember, we are in a, I can't tell. We're X, X or T. So X or T, see here's, this is from the, the website of the Public Utilities Commission. So let's say we get 20, whereas, uh, let's look at R or S or W. This is like Bakersfield or something down here. So they get more, R. Okay, so this is, this is uh, like Sacramento area. They're getting, so we're getting uh, 20 as our baseline, and Sacramento area is getting 30. So they're getting 50% more electricity at this reduced rate, but they have air conditioning and we don't. So this is this interesting thing of like, the, we're getting together, we're deciding how to regulate the price of electricity in a way that's fair, and people that live uh, in a different area are gonna have a different amount of cheap electricity. Uh, we'll come back to this, different prices and different, different metering. Uh, but the general term here, if you're trying to get under your demand curve, and you're trying to pick away with different prices, is price discrimination. Different prices to different consumers to get different parts of their willingness to pay. We'll talk about this a little bit when we talk about monopoly and monopsony and stuff. But right now when we're talking about demand, this is when we think about charging different prices to different people. And we have a whole bunch of different examples in our society about that. Did you have a question? Sure, absolutely. I mean, who has a hot tub or a swimming pool, right? And you know, this, I, sometimes I feel like in this class I could reshift the whole class to talk about drought. But you know, a lot of times I talk about electricity here. 